let's move on to viruses causing encephalitis there are about 55 of them which can affect cns the common ones are herpes jab b rhabdo measles and dengue and this is what we're going to cover herpes by far is most commonly you see in routine practice it happens because of reactivation of herpes simplex virus which is common in immunocompetent patients so you have a virus in the brain which is normally there and can get reactivated typically you get bilateral asymmetric limbic involvement so you get these hyper intensities in the mesial temporal region subfrontal cortex and subcortical white matter and also it can go along corpus callosum typically most of them show restricted diffusion in the initial stage hemorrhage is present in about 20% cases and then the outcome in these patients is bad typical location is frontal mesial temporal and insular cortex compared to that jab b which is caused by arbovirus has central involvement so you get involvement of thalamus and basal ganglia most of them are symmetric there is association of cystic circuses with jab b because of pandemicity and then it is asymmetric so the larger affection is on the side of where cystic circus is present rabies is now extremely uncommon it is caused by rhabdovirus this is my own case and these two are borrowed cases typically you get involvement of basal ganglia thalamus hypothalamus initially and then eventually when the patient is about to die you get involvement of brain stem subacute sclerosing panencephalitis is another relatively common viral infection in our country it's caused by measles virus years after primary infection or sometimes after vaccination but few years after getting vaccination so you get symmetric and asymmetric hyperintensities typically starting with frontal parietal lobes and then eventually affecting temporal lobe outcome is very very dismal it's a progressive disorder so initially you get brain swelling and then you start getting atrophy you get decreased na increased choline and increased myoinositol because of demyelination that happens and then gliosis dengue was very very common in last decade luckily it is getting lesser out of the numbers involvement of cns is very very low so you get less than 1% affection in dengue, dengue in cns but it's a very well known neurological complication of dengue infection and there are four ways how dengue can affect brain the commonest way is because of neurotropism again as i said seen in less than 1% cases and it presents like encephalitis myelitis or meningitis the second common is about a week or 5 days after getting dengue which is immune mediated so you can have presentation like giabari edem or optic or lower cranial neuritis when the patient is bad and in dengue shock syndrome you can get the metabolic complications like brain edema cerebral anoxia also hematological when the platelets really drop and there is some thrombocytopenia or dehydration causing hemoconcentration then you get sinus thrombosis or hemorrhages in the brain and this is one such case this patient came almost after 15 days of getting dengue from outside icu into our intensive care succumbed about 3 4 days after getting admitted at our place what you see here are multiple petechial hemorrhages large hemorrhage in corpus callosum and lot of brain edema all over the place these are kind of worst case scenario majority of them recover well